Hello. This is my first book review, my channel. I hope it becomes the first of many, but we shall see. Today I shall be reviewing Tales of the Dying Earth by Jack Vance. This is actually a four book series. We have a, this is an omnibus with considerable water damage. We have a, all four books in the Dying Earth series by Jack Vance. These are published from 1950 to 1984. They were very intermittently published. Like the first one came out in 1950, the second one in 1966, I believe. The third one in the 70s, and the last one in 1984. I don't know why there's such a delay, but what I do know is that these are very marvelous stories, and they actually were having a huge, huge impact on the development of Dungeons and Dragons. So, what most people cite from these books, and kind of the reason they're but all famous, some would argue, is because of the advancing magic system. Now, this is a very interesting aspect of the series, but I think that we cannot risk overlooking what a genius, brilliant work it is, um, that it has many great qualities even without the Vancey Magic System. But just to explain, so you may have heard of this because the Vancey Magic System is how, say in Dungeons and Dragons, you have different levels of wizards, right? And so those wizards will memorize spells, and they use them kind of like ammunition. At least that's how it was in the first editions of Dungeons and Dragons that I'm more familiar with. But basically, when a wizard memorizes a spell for the day, after they use a spell, it's deleted from their memory, and then they have to wait until the next day in order to actually, um, use it again, or they find different spells to memorize and such. Uh, Tales of the Dying Earth actually was the series where this idea came from. So the wizards in this world, which I'll describe in more detail later, um, have this concept whereby they tame sandistons, these uh, creatures in the air, uh, in order to use spells. And they memorize codes, and they send those codes to the creatures, and then they're deleted from the mind. The setting itself takes place in the far, 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 far future, millions of years in the future in which the Earth is, well, it's about to die, as his name says. Although not the Earth per se, it's that the Sun is actually about to go out. The Sun is red and dying, and there are very few people left on Earth. The idea being that uh, it's so far in the future that every single aspect of our society today is basically forgotten about. Like It's never even mentioned. There's no ruins of our society. When there are things mentioned from ancient societies, which there are a lot actually, there's a whole rich history of this world, um, they are never from our world, it's always from other Aeons, because it takes place in the 21st Aeon, but there's things like the 16th Aeon, the 20th Aeon, etc. So, <clears throat> one shortcoming the setting has, and it's well, probably the main one, is basically that even though the world is about to end, it actually has very little impact on characters' actions. In a subtle sense, you could say it's kind of the reason why so many people are very hedonistic and evil in the series, but they mentioned that the fact that Earth's about to die pretty frequently, yet... It's never like, oh my god, we're all going to die. This is the last moment of our lives. Ah, No, it's actually very much just a background. Like, oh, hey, the Earth's going to die any minute now. Uh, you know, none of this matters. Ha ha ha. And then you just do it the drink. <clears throat> and they oftentimes make many long-term plans that might not take into effect until years later or months later, even though the Earth could die at any moment. And I find that kind of ridiculous. It's also not very scientifically accurate, but I mean, that's mainly for our hindsight today because... Once the sun reaches the point where it's about to go out, uh, it actually won't go out in the sense of the dying Earth. It'll swallow up many plants in the solar system, and it won't go colder. It'll actually be very hot, and until so all life on Earth is destroyed because it can't be supported anymore, and eventually it'll be destroyed in a giant supernova. But Jack Vance maybe didn't know that, so I'm willing to forgive him. And also, it really doesn't matter anyway, because it doesn't affect how the book is in terms of its actual quality. So... Now, <clears throat> the first book in the series is called just The Dying Earth, and basically it's a collection of short stories that all take place with these different characters trying to achieve different goals. I really enjoyed all of them, because not only did it take place in this very interesting world, with very interesting characters, and some of the visually interesting settings I've ever read in any book, but each of the stories is connected to the next one in like very subtle ways. They're not immediately stated, but you can tell where they're coming from. Like they'll mention some of the same characters, uh, some of the plot lines in previous ones will continue on the next one. It's a very interesting literary device, and I like it very much. However, the first one, in a sense, isn't super ambitious, because they're just short stories, it's not a novel. It's books two and three that are actually really the highlight point of the series. It's called the Kugel Duology. And Kugel the Clever, his name is spelled weird, it's a C-U-G-E-L, is basically a thief. He was actually the inspiration for the D&D Thief class, in part, um, who has this uh, long-term rivalry with I have no idea how to pronounce his name. It's spelled like I-O-U-C-O-U-N-O, -O -O, whatever. The Laughing Magician, like Yakono, that's what I call him. Yakono the Laughing Magician. And he has his rival with him in the last two books. The, the second being uh, The Eyes of the Overworld, and the third one being 
Kugel Saga. Um, these were actually some of the funniest books I've ever in my life. They're they're structured a lot like short stories in that like they don't really have that much impact on the plot, each the individual adventures Kugel gets into, but they're just so hilarious and entertaining to read. I love them anyway. Um, then the fourth book, unfortunately, is actually in my mind what keeps this being a five-star series, although it does have some other flaws, is um, <clears throat> called Rialto the Marvelous. And it's okay, but it's definitely very disappointing compared to the first three, and I was actually aware of this, like I'd heard of this before, and I understand why. So it takes place for three short stories, although the first and the third are much shorter than the second one, which is kind of like book length. But basically, the first story is um, about, a, is, well, all the stories in general are about this council of wizards, and one of their members is Rialto the Marvelous. And Rialto the Marvelous tries to outsmart the other wizards as they try to wrong him in different stories. Um, the first one involves a lot of very upsetting views on women that I'm not sure if they were reflecting what Jack Vance, the author, actually believed in. Or they were just what the characters believed in. But nonetheless, it wasn't a very entertaining story. The second one is the best of the three. Um, but at the same time, it's not really... It doesn't really live up to the previous ones. It's nowhere near as clever, nowhere near as entertaining. It's uh, just okay. And the third one I thought was interesting because it finally explained what the Ion Stones are. There's these stones, I think it's right, but not some. They're uh, spelled only as an abbreviation. I-O-U-N. And they did appear as Dungeons & Dragons item eventually. But they just wizards collect them. And they can repel magic and absorb magic. And they're an important plot point in the story. But they don't actually really explain what they are on until the last one. <clears throat> anyway, so about the setting. Basically, magic exists far, far in the future. But the idea is, you know, they view it as more technology. So that's why the series is considered science fantasy. Though I actually consider it just being straight up fantasy. Because technology plays very little role in the series. In the first book, in one of the short stories, they go to an abandoned city. And they mention... Um, <clears throat> that they have ancient ruins there, and they actually have flying cars and such. But that's like the most example you have of anything that we would consider like science fiction technology. Everything else is magic. So I would like on my bookshelf, I would put this in the science fi in the I mean the fantasy section if I had room. I actually had to put it in the science fiction section, which is fairly small anyway. But just because I didn't have any room for the in the fantasy section. Uh, but what I this book is most famous for is that Jack Vance is a uh, He's not the most accessible writer. He very, very, very frequently... Uh, well, you know how um, George Orwell had that law of writing where he says, never use a big word where a small word will do, or something to that effect? Well, Jack Vance did not agree with that. He uses big words, and I mean enormous words, you will never hear it anywhere else, likely. And some of them he actually made up himself, but he uses enormous words all the freaking time. And sometimes it gets to a point where you really can't say and understand anything the characters are saying, and it's just googly gook. I actually find it kind of entertaining anyway. Um, like uh, when the uh, curator curator of the Museum of Man in one of the short stories in the Dying Era of the first book has this really long explanation of how this machine works, and it's just pure googly gook, and a lot of the words are made up. And if you look up the words, literally the first results are always uses in which Jack Vance said them, so I find that kind of funny. But yeah, basically, he uses words you're never going to hear anywhere else again. But I think it adds to the richness of the story, and all the characters talk like that. It reminds me of Shakespeare, how he's known for, well, not that Jack Vance is anywhere near Shakespeare in terms of doing this, but Jack Vance makes up a lot of words that actually became used in other sources. Like in Dungeons and Dragons, I keep mentioning Dungeons and Dragons' entire review. If in case you haven't noticed, I am a big fan of the game. Although I think these stories definitely should be viewed outside of that context, and I'm sorry for enforcing it, but uh, they did have a big influence on the game. But anyway... So there's things called Libram, which is not defined in the book. I'm upset that, well, we have the impression that's a book. But in Dungeons and Dragons, there's supposed to be these like books that you read and they give you certain skills. That came from the series. And also these various other words that are never defined in any sense, and they just sort of exist. Anyway, um, in conclusion, <clears throat> I would say I would rate this series as a 4 out of 5 stars. I would want to give it a 5 stars, but React to the Marvelous unfortunately brings it down too much. Because that story is like a 3 out of 5 stars at best. But it's a very excellent series. I was constantly entertained while reading it. Uh, it had fascinating characters. Actually, one of the flaws of the characters, they don't really have much philosophical depth or anything like that. Like, Kuo the Clever, who's an amazing character. He's the, well, the best and definitely the best character. He's the main character of the second and third books. He's a classic anti-hero. He doesn't even happen to a backstory. And his behavior is only motivated really by greed or selfishness or pride. But, he said, but I like him, though, anyway. Because he's just so entertaining. Because he was a character, basically, who... Um, he was called Kugel the Clever because he's very smart and not smart people, 
but oftentimes he was a lot less clever than he actually, like, he thought he was more clever than he really was, and he makes really stupid mistakes that he really can spot easily. And I like that. He's definitely not overpowered in any sort of, in any sense of the word. And although he's good at fighting, he rarely uses it because he prefers to outsmart people. That's another thing people notice about the series. Most of the uh, action and conflict, uh, it's not so much about people fighting each other, although there's a little bit of that. It's mostly people using contracts and agreements because in the dying era, they have this culture that, that values honor very much, even though people are constantly trying to take advantage of each other. Um, in any case, <clears throat> the scenery and descriptive prose are marvelous. I, you have these extremely interesting characters and locations. There are these monsters and creatures that are just fascinating. This book was actually, the first book was written around the same time as Lord of the Rings. And I've also heard some people point this out, um, that had this book become famous as Lord of the Rings, it would have taken fantasy in like an entirely different direction. Like, it's just, it's one of, like, if you're looking for a fantasy book that has nothing in common with Lord of the Rings, check out Tales of the Dying Era. Because seriously, this book is complete, well, the series is completely, completely original. It's like, it's, it's a whole other animal. It's not even the same animal kingdom. You have magic, but it works in a much more fine system. You have these protagonists on a quest, but they're terrible people. The world does not involve dragons or elves or dwarves. It involves terrifying human-like or abominations of monsters that live in the forest and wilderness. The most of the characters are con men and indecent people. But it's just a fascinating, fascinating world. And some of the most interesting, colorful descriptions you'll ever read in fantasy. So overall, like I said earlier, this gets a four out of five stars. Well, five stars for the first three books, three out of five stars for the last one. I highly recommend it, although it's not for, well, I'd like, to I'd like to recommend it, but it's not really for everyone because you have to actually be able to tolerate the very arcane prose that he uses because Jack Vance is oftentimes uses words not so much because he needs to, or he hardly ever needs to, but really just because he likes the atmosphere and tone they create. But I thought that was actually interesting anyway, and I've actually kept a list. He inspired me to kind of keep a list of interesting words I can use, and he kind of, for a while, he started changing my thinking. So I actually started to try and think like Google the Clever, like in terms of like vocabulary and stuff. And I thought that was fascinating. So yes, four out of five stars. I very much like this book. In the future, I don't want to do reviews on entire like series of books. I will be doing a Broken Empire review at some point in the future. I just need to finish with a friend of mine and we, he's kind of slow about it. But uh, I'm doing it this time because I've just started my booktube channel and I don't want to do each book in depth when I've already read all four books. There's no need for four different videos. But in the future, I prefer to view one book at a time. Anyway, um, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully, comment, like, subscribe, uh, feed the hungry, soulless pits that is the uh, YouTube algorithms, and uh, have a nice day.